This is Pilliter. Um, today is February the 4th, 2022. I am here with Shane Bugby, who I talked on Twitter with, and he's a very interesting fellow I wasn't aware of until now. And it's nice talking to you, Shane. Well, thank you. Nice talking to you, Pilliter. Well, the reason why I wanted to have this podcast actually is because at such when I, when I was getting into the arts and interesting, you know, in the, the punk circle and like that, of course, you're probably going to come across a soft cover book of apocalypse culture edited by Adam Parfrey. And you're kind of exposed to these early transgressive artists. Uh, when I talk to, you know, fellow millennial peers today, it's kind of almost a different generation. And to bring up names like Boyd Rice or Peter Sotos, it's almost bizarre and you don't hear that and you have to dig for it. And when you do find that, it kind of has different out, kind of like different scenes in such a way. Uh, one particular scene in my own art, when I was, when I did go into the power electronic phase, I was really into Sean Partridge and his strange Partridge family temple um, aesthetic, which was kind of this crass fast foodism and mixed with Charles Manson stuff. Some of that crew hangs on Instagram. Uh, they go by the Partridge family and things like that have always fascinated me. And we kind of were corresponding back and forth on Twitter saying, you've seen that scene too. In fact, you know, you actually have a Wikipedia article and you've kind of know what I'm talking about kind of from that transgressive area. So I, I guess, Shane, how, how would you like introduce yourself and how did you get into that scene yourself? Well, I, I, I don't kind of know it. It's like I'm a fucking doctor. OK, I, you know, <laughs> I, I've studied it for 30 years. I've been involved in it. So I'm, I'm like it's like like a, any scene. There's all these layers and I like a, like hip hop or anything, uh, graffiti culture. There's culture vultures that come in and take from low class folks and they create this this uh, extension of the culture. And that's what Sean Partridge or Boyd Rice did. They they came into a working class, Anton LaVey is a fry cook. Boyd Rice is not, he comes from money. Okay. So they come in and, and scoop these ideas and present them to their, their, their network of college friends or whatever it is. And they create something different. Um, that's, that's, why you, that's why you wouldn't have known of me is because they, they, these people, the culture vultures stifle the people who actually inspire it. Same as the beat poets, uh, Neil Cassidy, was the real originator of the beat poets. And they all, they admitted, we stole his, his shit. We stole his pulse, how he was doing it because he was uneducated and came from trauma and all this other shit, like poor people. And that's how poor people and, and people with trauma communicate is through art. And then these well-adjusted motherfuckers come in and take that and present it as some commodity and they make it safe for their consumer. That's a Sean Partridge or Boyd Rice. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because I've had run-ins with Jim Goad and Partridge before. Me and too. It's funny because the first time I was introduced was Partridge when I used to do podcasting in 2017. I was a co-host for The Stark Truth and he got this guy called Sean Partridge on and he's this Hindu who worships McDonald's and things like that. And I'm just like, oh, that's so, that's so bizarre. And like you said, it's connected to those figures and just trying to understand it, I, I also seen a, a correlation between the far right and some of those nationalist avant-garde spheres, you know, what you would call the post-alt-right taking it over now. And we could go back into that whole, you know, fascist aesthetics, Boyd Rice thing. And I'm just trying to understand where all this kind of, you might call hipster racism subculture brings about. Well, that's, you know, that what's more dangerous, a Nazi or a nihilist? I would say the nihilist is, might be worse. And we came, we were rooted in nihilism. We weren't rooted in fucking right-wing politics back then. People confuse it when they pull my shit up and call me a neo-Nazi or whatever it is. Like, it's so ridiculous when you look at the body of my work. So it's just another bully on the left or somewhere else trying to make, 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 a, make a way for themselves. But the reality is we were involved in nihilism. We saw what was coming. We are prophetic in the, the aesthetic terrorism movement. As I say, the world is on fire. You should listen to us. And when we took the, the baton from the hippies, they gave us the peace and love option. And we said, we're going to take hate and violence. Nothing you're doing is working. It's only getting fucking worse. So we presented, we, we mirrored society. You're talking about black metal folks. This is where all this stuff is co-opted from present, you know, like what you're talking about, you know? Well, I was thinking, well, it's fun. Um, 
it was about uh, before COVID happened in 2019, Ladia Lunch came to School of Visual Arts to have just to talk about a, a new film she was in. And right afterwards, well, I was with a friend too. We asked about Jim Go to her. And she kind of remembers the days of Answer Me, but quite unaware about post Jim Goad writing for, say, Countercurrents, a white nationalist. She's blog. a liar. She's a liar. <laughs> she knows all about that. Oh, oh well, that's she, what well, that's... everyone here that is trying to have a career knows to disassociate. Get the fuck out of here. She knows exactly about her culture. That's her life. She knows exactly what Jim Goad's doing. She, she understands all of it. She's not stupid. If she's playing coy with you and you're taking that, you better check your own self. She's a liar. She knows exactly what's going well, on. Well, this is it's funny because I meet a lot of these people and I always get a different story. So it's interesting to hear your story because it's not my, a stupid my, story. It's a great observation. I mean, you, come on. She's a really smart woman who survived all this shit. You think she doesn't know what's going on with her culture and where she came from and people she's interviewed? She's interviewed Goad and she let go to have a pro had to have a, uh, a microphone and talk shit about me, but she never came to me and asked me my side of the story. And she never let me have my say. And this is another fucking asshole that, that, that perpetrates this culture vulture shit. They yeah. cut out the people they steal from in order to make the, uh, our reality theirs. Well, when I have tried to interview Jim in the past, right now I'm considered to be some liberal journalist, but I'm not. I'm just a guy with a computer trying to understand this transgressive culture. And that's interesting. You say lunch, if she knew that, uh, you know, I've made the same observations before, then that means Chuck Palahniuk of Fight Club and Margaret Cho are also fans of Jim Goad and know about this kind of subtle, but yeah. Yeah, they are. They're not necessarily fans. They consumed it and they were interested in the artwork. I wouldn't say they're like followers. Just because you take something in and, and associate with Jim Goad for a moment, it doesn't mean you are Jim Goad. How did mm. that happen in this world? Like I associated with the guy too. And everyone will, these younger kids will be like attached to me. I'm like, no, dude, we associate. That's what artists do. You keep coming to me from your fucking in, employment perspective. I'm not employed. I'm employed myself. That's like what a real artist does. We don't fucking, we don't call it a, a side, a side hustle, or we don't brand ourselves like cows. We take the vow of poverty and we fucking do it. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, Every well, another thing I wanted to mention as well is like if if it's in that I, I you know I had this word and I used to call it hipster racism where it's like everybody kind of knows about that reactionary anti-liberal thing whether it's punk rock or not, but it's also at the same time that the most softest people are you know fans of goat or something and that makes me think if that 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 kind of intersexual sphere works why is it that when you you know tell people kind of this. And this gets back to our our first correspondence. I came across a book, uh, C.B. Robertson. He's kind of like a, he hangs out with the Wolf of Vinland. He writes philosophy. He had a front cover art done by Jack Donovan. And this book came out in 2022 in February or Jan end of January. I forgot the title, but it just made me think like, I, w I wonder if Jack Donovan is still of relevance or just some bizarre footnote to that post, you know, fascist aesthetics culture. I mean, he's probably still hanging with C.B. Robertson and doing art for him, kind of like the schools, this masculine thing. But again, uh, I remember Goad had a book called The New Church Ladies, and he said he coined that from Jack Donovan. So that must have some kind of relevance in that anti-liberal sphere. But I, I just wanted to hear your opinion on Jack Donovan. Well, I mean, we're, we've grown up. So, so my, our, our time back then was uh, search, searching for answers. I don't know if you even have a fucking mind until you're 25. But so this is a different thing. I knew Jack is Jack Malambranch. And Jack uh, did a bunch of velvet painting for me. And Jack was a very kind and, and young boy coming into the Church of Satan. I'm part of the old guard. Like I'm the last of the people who knew Anton LaVey. And, um, and so... What's going on now is whole, you know, like it's, it's that whole is different. But, but what I know about Jack is he was a kind young man. That's what I knew about him. What he grew into, like this big, fucking huge built guy, is a whole different character for him. I, but I don't think I don't think artists point for, for Jack, or even Goad. I don't think artists and writers should be held. Maybe Goad. He's become a propagandist. I'm talking early days with Answer Me and shit like that we don't have your fucking rules we don't we don't not, we're not politicians and we're not looking for votes and we're not looking for friends so when we express ourselves it's generous and people should be thanking us no matter if they're right wing or left wing they're being honest and you need that information to come to some idea of where we're going in society 
you asked why people that are, let's say, um, I don't want to say weak, but you're talking about left-wing people that are attracted to goad. A lot of people have been victimized or have had a lack of power, which is most of us are attracted as power symbols like the goat, like the swastika, or like people like a goad that come out like that. You're attracted to it because you're trying to understand how to gain power. And I think that's- I, I wrote, I, I, you know, there's a lot to say about these figures because when I was, you know, I, I'm done graduate school, but when I was researching say countercurrents, which Jim Goad writes for, that's kind of like this esoteric white nationalist blog where, you know, the other editor is a closed gay white nationalist, making huh. it even more like the niche, you know, deaf in June, you know, being queer, but you're neo-Nazi. And that, that always fascinated me. And it was kind of a very niche club and they wouldn't let people in, but they certainly allowed Jim in. And yet all this, you know, big talk about saving the white race or something, and it's more about lifestyle and subculture. And that made me thinking, there, there was another um, uh, individual by the name of, um, well, there's two, Brandon Adamson and Richard Hoke. They kind of are influenced from one another and they'll talk about being radical at rallies because uh, rallies was one, say, a white nationalist burger joint and then blacks came in and ruined it and therefore we must celebrate a fast food crassism to save the white race. But you could see how this logic, I was thinking, oh, this is a lot like um, Sean Partridge when he talks about golden arches and things. And there's that level of transgression, but when you take it out and you make it about like racial nationalism or something like that, it's almost like the avant-garde art becomes meaningless. And that's just some uh, culture, like you're saying this, the signifying, you're, you're showing signs to be transgressive, but putting it in this other weird light and so I wrote this article in 2018 called Fast Food Fascism, how I was angry about that. And it's kind of funny because I was more pro Sean Partridge, but I want to hear more of your criticism of Sean Partridge, that whole Partridge family <sighs> temple and how that kind of pipe loop, that, that pipeline went into white nationalism because I'd actually gotten into some controversy by those uh, you know, white not writers who basically said, oh no, wh why are you saying I, I steal from this? I didn't steal from anything. I was like, no, it's just the, the absurdity about what is transgressive even about McDonald's. Okay, there's a lot there. So you're gonna have to control this. I'm gonna, I might go everywhere. So um, first of all, like uh, stealing shit, you know, everything's derivative and they're inspired by it. So people, you know, everyone online is like afraid to get caught being inspired, which is stupid and as far as art goes, but that's, you're, you're, this is what you're running into. You're running into actual art smashing into commercial and capitalism and stuff that doesn't meet. We artists and stuff are, are truth seekers and truth speakers. So we're smashed. I'm looking across at a painting I did and it has a huge Baphomet face bleeding and it has a, the McDonald golden arches in flames and not Don Mc, Mc, Ronald McDonald, you know, in flames. And so mine is exactly the opposite of what you're talking about. Like them promoting like a McDonald. Mine is like, that needs to be destroyed. That needs to be wiped off the face of the earth, that shit. And so they're just, they're just uh, presenting their pro-capitalist politics. You know, they're pro- uh, Right. It is, it is fascism if you want to go with the fucking Mussolini definition of the, you know, corporations and, uh, and the state colluding. And so that's what they're saying when they put a McDonald's art or, or, or Sean saying this, he's, he, he's okay with that. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of the critic of capitalist, capitalism myself, and I always used to think, in my anti-capitalist mind, by making this Ron English, you know, uh, fast food, Ronald McDonald's, it, it, you subvert it and it becomes transgressive in a punk rock layer. But then it's like, like you're exactly saying, it becomes pro-capitalist because at the end of the day, you know, pop art and that kind of Milton Glaserism, it's kind, it can be very crass and it's, it, it doesn't motivate people. It's lame, right? It's like well, Care Bear. It, it, it is a branch of, I say, shock culture. You know, you're looking to be seen. So you put like Frank Kozik, uh, I, you know, I did his first Frank Kozik art show. Frank we used to, before I did it, one of the things that caught everyone's eye, and it was a really great poster, and it's, posters are propaganda and they're meant to bring people in to buy tickets to a concert. This is what Frank is good at, propaganda. And so he put up a Fred Flintstone with a swastika armband shooting heroin. And it was a total contradiction image. But it was so shocking to see because back then, kids, if you fucked with Mickey, you had cops would like you, you did a Mickey shirt. 
they're going to come in your house and take everything. Like that's what was happening. So when you guys are all mixing up culture, it's beautiful for me to see because I was like, man, that, that was serious. That was serious shit back then, like 30 years ago. And so that's where it started. Like people were trying to be like, we have a right to, to use Mickey Mouse any way we want because it's in our mind, you know, exer- ex- ex- uh, using the free, um, what is the uh, fuck? Fair use idea. Like if it's in my mind, I have a right to put it into artwork. I had the right to do this stuff. And so I, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm going all over the place with that. No, but you're on something there because when you're saying Fred Flintstone with a swastika, that it's kind of not allowed in 2022. And that's somewhere. I'm bringing where, it back. I'm bringing yeah, it back. Yeah. yeah. Like I like, you see, I like that culture too. I mean, I, I was like the old school juxtapose magazines. Can I things. stop it? Wait, I got to say, I'm not bringing it back. I don't, I'm just sort of <laughs> cheesing because I don't want to hurt people's feelings and I get how intense things are right now. So I, I am there very sensitive to what's going on and, and the conversation changed, you know, post internet. So I'm just, I was just teasing. <laughs> well, I mean, again, transgressive art has always been something I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in my library right now and I have all those nineties, 2000s esque zine that where my generation it's kind of it's a weird story because everyone has a different part of the story you know in fact when today when when Adam Parfrey died there was this kind of media glorification of being him being you know the only transgressive art publisher but I remember at time on his you know Wikipedia article it was just normal he was just a, a bizarre footnote but when Parfrey died there was now this kind of pre-explosion that yeah. Parfrey was this pre-Vice magazine. Um, Parfrey yeah. is another one of these fucking culture vultures. And what they do is they attach themselves to really cool hipsters. Hipsters in the original sense of the word, kids. Hipsters were like, it was people of color. It was blues artists. It was jazz artists. It was people that were in zoot suits. It was a, everyone was expressing their culture and they were beaten in the streets for it. The homosexuals, you know, trans, trans movement. That was hipster. How it flipped into uh, obscene consumer, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I wanted to know more about Adam and your yeah, relationship. And, and Adam is one of those people. He would have, he, all apocalypse culture is, hey, let me gather all of these people that are actually cool and point them in my direction because I am not. I am a shell of a person with nothing inside. Okay. Adam was a fucking poser from get go. Okay. He was acting like his father or grandfather, or whatever it is. I mean, he was opposed. Have you had any of his family attacked you or associates? Well, come near me. All of these people are afraid of me because I'm the fucking real deal. I'll tear their head off because I don't give a fuck. (laughs) They care. They have money to lose. I got nothing to lose. So please do bring them my way. I remember it's weird when I was on the And also, hey, I called. I don't know if you know, I got in a war with Boyd Rice the other day and I call him out on a debate. No, tell me about that. When when was this? He ran. I couldn't believe it. This guy that presents, but of course authoritarians run. Of course they do, they're insecure pricks. This guy calls me out on Instagram, you know, puts me on blast. I defend myself very well, attack him back. And then he starts deleting all my responses, blocking me. I go on another account, do the same fucking thing. He does the same thing. I'm making a zine out of it. That little cry baby. That's funny because I do have my, I have a few Instagram accounts, but I do follow that whole Partridge Boyd Rice scene. I noticed that you know they all became i mean i kind of look at boyd's insta but not really it's usually that partridge circle from whale song to others oh, God, i hate them so so i, I just I'm, I'm just curious because I, i'm all new to this and i'm just like what what is this partridge family it seems like this post boyd rice culture they're on this very like you say the culture vulture um I'm necessary a- i mean what exactly were you writing what were they saying on instagram how did I that met- con- okay well first of all have you ever heard of michael hunt publishing or mike hunt comics I it's very familiar Mike Diana comic books might is right that's all stuff I published under other names you said I don't know who who you are but I would almost Uh, bet if you're in transgressive culture you have one or two of my books on your shelf yeah yeah I've I've seen might is right yeah so so you've had you everyone in this has my books in their shelf they just don't have my name in their mouth you mean the red beard right Ragnar red beard any back from the yeah I was the one publishing it for 20 years okay for only one publishing it for 20 years and I took it out. I had it taken out on tour with black metal bands. I promoted the fuck out of that book. And it was probably not the best to do. But uh, that's the way I've it goes. seen it now on Chip Smith's nine banded books. The last I saw might as nine right. what nine banded books. Chip Smith. What is that? 
Ch- Chip Smith, he publishes, you know, if there's a new Peter Sotos book out, he'll publish it. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll put Might is Right on there. He'll put Uncle Fester. Oh, yeah. he'll, put, he'll put a lot of the old school, like Nine Banded Books was kind of post Feral House, uh, Chip Smith. And some okay. of his books are pretty, uh, James Mulick, kind of that very Larry Clark-esque. So, Eric, yeah, well, they're, they're following a trail that was blazed back, you know, by me and other people. So I, I don't really know them. They're in my dust. But um, Power Fry did a lot of ripping off where he was a culture vulture. Um, I'm not sure if he accomplished anything that was decent. I suppose, I suppose Lords of Chaos was a really cool accomplishment because that actually brings forward a culture that people want to erase but had an amazing influence on a revolutionary moment, a, a time to say, fuck you, we're fighting back. Whether people want to look at the black metal movement now as neo-Nazi and all this kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it wasn't, and back in the day, we were just angry. I don't think anyone had a full form formation of politics like today, like Jim Goad, he's formed his political. I notice anger is a reoccurring theme. You just have to be angry and transgressive and agitating. And I think that's almost in punk rock spirit. It doesn't matter what your subscribed ideology is. You just have to be mad at the other person. Let me ask you, what would, what would a guy that has, is, is able to live on his fucking parents dime have to be angry about? What the fuck does a guy like like Boyd Rice have to be angry about? He's got all the resources in the world. He's from a rich family. He can send him to college. That anger comes from the working class. That anger comes from people in Norway or in, 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 in um, Hammond, Indiana, or Gary, Indiana, or all the ghettos. That's where this anger comes that are is always co-opted by some political asshole. And then people come back at me, someone who had legit rage, and puts me as some political group. Like, I'm not no fucking... I'm not fucking Nazi. Are you, look at my work. Look at what I do. Nazis will kill me if they get in power. Are you fucking nuts? It's crazy talk. But yeah, they seem to be only interested, as I said before, Nazism on an artificial scale. They're, they're not really based upon this like classic totalitarian fascism. Well, no, it was a bit, well, back then it was an exploration of control because we're all controlled. So it's just like a common psychology, psychological breakdown. Like people who have no control are looking to have control. So we're like, wow, Hitler, you know, ultimate, you know, authoritarian control. We want some control. What's this? What is this? So you start exploring it within your art. You know, you, you try to understand these things. And, and through that, we got into and, and people don't really, I've heard kids not really take the idea that pre-internet was a different world. You're in these bubbles. So you're not having input from any other communities. So, mm. you know, it's, a, it's an echo chamber. And so now we're not in that anymore. So it's a real interesting difference well the way i you know when i started doing the internet i mean you could go back to 2009 when i was just making art websites on you're in the man now dog ytmd.com i only really started to do podcasting in 2016 as being a co-host and then along that you know walking that path you're forced to do youtube and twitter yeah and all the latest mediums and then you kind of yeah it's definitely internet culture kind of goes through phases i remember being being you are hooked on archive.org so that's a good thing (laughs) well yeah i've tried i'm trying to upload i'm still uploading these like i have five other books i got to upload on full pdf on internet archive where when i was writing as a teenager and it's just there and people have those copies but you know a lot of people don't look at data the way that they secure it like books data is kind of fleeing if you're on TikTok and you see a 60 second video it's on to the next for all i know a big tech elite channel can blow it up and then you lose it forever and i think that's why the podcast the pre-recorded podcast that you record for 50 minutes that kind of died starting around the late teens where you were having these live streams or blood sports where people just yell at you and you start drama and you do pranks and Wow. The average podcast today seems to be what I believe come town or red scare where it's just a bunch of dudes talking for six hours in a very hip setting. And is that of value or is that more just this fleeting conversation you log in and log out to? Well, it is it, a whole different beast. Uh, a podcast is on an RSS feed. It's a, there's a technical definition for it and people keep sliding these definitions or using words that had a different meaning. So it gets confusing as to what we're talking about, but things that are presented on YouTube for me, an originate, you know, original podcast are vlogs or video logs or video blogs. 
you know, that's what that is. I get you're putting audio on YouTube and you got to put it everywhere and people consume their, their media in different, they have different loyalties. Um, well, I, I mean, don't I think, to... I don't think documenting things, whether it's podcasts, photos or anything is, is, um, is, is going anywhere if it, it's actually hit. Cause if something goes viral, you can almost bet it's going to end up on archive.org. It's going to last a little longer. And, and so that seems the viral thing seemed to be, it's a weird thing about art. Like it's, it's like, um, it's almost like pop culture, but it's not these viral things. There's almost like an honesty in them. It's, it's a real strange thing, the internet now, you know, with that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I think the archive.org is doing a great job at, at archiving a lot of that stuff. I don't know. Well, the thing is, I actually, I have like over 500 YouTube videos that I would used to do in the past five years. And Beautiful. so recently, you know, there's been BitChute and Odyssey where those are clone platforms of YouTube, where in case if your YouTube channel gets blown out for something you say and you lose all those videos, at least BitChute and Odyssey clone them. Oh God, that's great, dude. Oh, I love hearing <laughs> that. No, no, yeah, it's true. Yeah, look at Odyssey. That just oh, came God. out of a few months ago and I'm on Odyssey as well. So if I make a video on YouTube, Odyssey clones that, copies that video and Kill puts me. it on there. So okay, it's so actually better than bitch you Odyssey. That's <laughs> I love this. I love this, dude. I never knew. Check this out. So I'm one of the first 10,000 people on YouTube and they still in a garage somewhere. And uh, I put up the Columbine blooper reel, which is on mm. my archive.org. And that was the first moment in YouTube's history. No joke. I know I have a lot of firsts, but that's just the way it is when you're hipsters, you know, you're, you're, you're a canary in the coal mine. And so they came up and, and this was documented in newspapers and everything. So they came up with a rule that you couldn't present violence on their platform anymore at some point during that whole exchange because people started arguing this is going to inspire more school shooters and shit like that and you know i just thought it was a funny little video myself well you know i i sometimes i use odyssey and bit shoot when if i'm like for example for example a few days ago uh there was a guy named matthew c harris who said death threats against ucla he uploaded a 800 page manifesto called death sentences and obviously there's a lot of foul language in there so you can't just read that on youtube obviously if you recorded it on uh you know put it up on bitshoot or odyssey you're fine because those platforms are don't have bots leaking to get you and they're all about securing those files and right. when matthew harris was crazily uploading 300 videos before his death threats on youtube they all got cloned on bitshoot and now everybody's on bitshoot looking at them so it's just important data that needs to be secured I we are on the same page there, friend. And I'm glad. And that's the, that's the issue when people keep telling Twitter what to do or Facebook, what to do. It, it comes down to, we, you have to create another platform to fill the void that they've created or the vacuum they've created. And they do like Facebook will let you get away with anything, which is obscene to me. And, and Twitter, I really do appreciate the new policies. I wish they'd refine it, but I do like being able to put in a, 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 a complaint against someone who's taken audio of mine out of context and presents three seconds of a 24-hour radio show that is really ugly audio and says that's how i'm defined like, how have you well because, because of the, my, yeah. my my creative con, con i go with the creative commons and my creative commons says i don't want any of my artwork that i'm generously offering up on archive that are cut up because i think it's misunderstood when it's cut up and so mm. most people, people disrespect the people creative commons. Kind of, and I, yeah. I, I wish creative commons was enforced more than uh, arguing with platforms about what they want to do with their platform and how they sell themselves, you know. Well, it seems like you've been in controversial, well, it's exactly you have opponents and rivals who have used your words, not just talking about, you know, liberal, big talent, big tech elite, but it seems like other opponents in those punk spheres that kind oh, of yeah. are hostile against you. Because well, you're no, just saying, just, but that's just they're bottom feeders, and this is what happens that you, you know, ankle biters, whatever you want to call them. This is how you climb the ladder, you attack the person on top. Same what I did the same fucking thing, but they think, like, I don't know what's going on. I, this is my business. Well, yeah, I mean, Jim Goat has said my name many times on bizarre podcasts, and he still does it today. And really, <laughs> I, I don't know, I just think it's his character or something. Oh, no, you yeah. know what, you got something because he's a guy, his tack. His, he, he's a guy who tries to hold his mud. He tries to not, not give people platforms. So you must've really fucking smacked the shit out of him somehow. Well, I mean, I gave, I gave him an interview and I was all on his side, but what happened was, I guess on a podcast, I said, yeah, Goat has this, I, I said in a comments, Goat has this anger issue. He flips the fuck out at everyone. 
and he just banned me on Twitter. He made three videos and then I said, hey, what, what, what's going on? And I realized he has anger issues. And then for the last three years, since 2018 on his group hug or whatever podcast that Joseph Francis Nally, <laughs> that bill eater guy, he's no good. And whenever people are subscribed to my channel and say, oh yeah, Jim, go drop your name on his podcast. I'm like, oh, that's great. But and I guess a negative, he's the Hatesville guy. Yeah, Jim Goad, here's a go. So, and I'm not a tough guy, believe me. I don't, I'm not, I'm not like a want to be a pacifist. I just can't figure out how, okay? So, so when I say something to Boyd Rice, like I call him out for a debate and I say, you come out here, I'm coming to you, whatever, you know, but we're going to fucking do this. We're going to, we're going to argue. Like when I say fight, I mean, argue, we're going to debate this dude. We're going to see what goes on. Um, Jim Goad, uh, on the Angry Right Mail tour, we're having these issues and he was a real bitch the whole fucking time. Like it was incredible. He acted like a rock star and we're doing this, this convict a favor. You know, he just comes out of prison and, and I'm because he's part of the culture. I, I am a person who is supporting of arts. So I'm like, yeah, we want to go on this tour. We're doing this angry white male tour. Cause that's what people are calling us. And we put him on this tour in Seattle. We're all hanging out with the mentors where the show starts, where they steal, they take the Ed Gein stone from me. Cause I had the, I had the Ed Gein stone on the tour and the Seattle police came and take it. And we had a good time up there. We're staying with this band called the mentors. They did, you know, disclaimer shock value here, you know, so turn off the radio It's going to be shocking word rape rock. And that's what they call it. So we're staying with them and we're having nice fresh salmon. We're having great, great time playing basketball. Jim goes alone in the, in a hotel because he doesn't want to hang out with us. Then later on, he hears about the party we're having. He's like, why didn't you invite me? I'm like, dude, you asked to be left alone and you would only just do the show and you don't want to bother. So he was just this, and he called the police. He's the one who called the police that came to get the Geenstone because he didn't mm -hmm. want it on tour because he thought he threatened his parole. But he wasn't a guy to tell me that. He didn't go, hey, I think that's going to threaten me. Please don't bring it. He just called. He had his girlfriend call the police on us to have the stone removed from the tour. You know, that's, that's it's. I mean, not to start gossip here, but it is funny. There, there's another fellow right-wing right well, punk rocker by the name of edwin olsen and he got into a fight with goad and he called antifa on him or something like that one of those stories but i th that seems really casual calling yeah, cops or antifa well, yeah goad is a guy who also will call out people who call cops i think he called out one of the guys in poison idea for dealing with cops you know he's like you're 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 a narc so he he's just a he's not a fucking he doesn't have um integrity he's just he's just an angry dot just guy He's right. an angry guy who really knows how to write very well. He's a very good, he's a great writer. And it's, it's, it, this is where it comes into when you're having mental illness and issues and you're, you, you just got to call that shit. Like dude's got mama issues. Dude's got anger issues. You kids are doing, you young men, excuse me, young folks are doing that now. And that's what you just need to do is apply warnings to these people, these old fucks, anger issues, mama issues, <laughs> just start dropping that down under his thing. Cause that's the fact, right? You can see it. Well, I'm very nostalgic about Goad's behavior because we're both from the same town. Let me, North let me town. go back to that fucking story I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. So later on in the tour, he's in the hotel room. He's like, hey, because now everything's getting canceled. New Mexico, they're going to cancel. Arizona, they're going to cancel. So I'm like, let's go there and fucking do the show right on the mayor's lawn. Like, let's just go pull up, pull in that fucking guy's parking lot and do it. And we'll film it. And Goad's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, who are, who are you talking, dude? You haven't said a word about planning this tour ever. And now you're going to tell us, you know, and he, he got up in my face and like, he started yelling at me. You're, you're this bully and all this stuff. And, and we're face to face and, and, you know, ready to fight. And it's fil being filmed. And I'm like, he's like, dude, if, if I weren't on parole, I'd knock your block off. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell anyone, dude, let's go. And he runs out of the room, runs to his hotel room, gets on a plane and leaves. So that's what Boyd Rice, that's what Jim Goat are really about. That's what these authoritarians are about. They don't, they when that. push comes to shove, they run. Because they don't have convictions in their ideas. They're just there to pick up girls or boys <laughs> or mates or oh, that's get, true. get attention. I think uh, Jim, like a year ago or something, had his Instagram with his new teenage girlfriend or something. So I'm not well, What's the big deal if it's, is she an adult or not? Because get the fuck out of here. I'm going to fucking fuck a 19-year-old too if she's an adult and she's coming on to me and, and everything's cool and copacetic and consensual. Get out of here. You're going to do the same thing too when you're 60. Well, my, my, my interest has always been is that they, they say these mean words and act like a tough guy, but when, you know, dared, they just run away. And I think that's the fight or flight, you know, mentality. Exactly. 
I've been in seven years of counseling, dude. I, you know, I, I get, I, you're exactly right. And that shit needs to be applied more. You need to fucking tell people what their issues are. And then they can make decent art maybe, you know? But, you know, because you realize that if Goad was, was to get into a fight, he'd go to jail again. That, that's the issue. So you have to fight. And probably he just says things. Because no, he didn't. We were in a hotel room. No one was going to see nothing. Uh, who's yeah, the I mean, witnesses? Yeah, consensual, yeah, who's the witness? Like, if you're in a, in a hotel room and you're all, like, in a gang, who in the fuck is going to talk to the cops? There was That moment was pure, dude. He could have swung. He was given the opportunity. It was pure. The, the person put down the camera and shut the camera up when he looked at it because it got serious. Everyone was serious. And we were all on one in one group. So no one there was pro cop. No one was going to go to the cops except Goad. <laughs> well, that's interesting because we're talking about sincerity because it makes me think if Goad writes for a white nationalist blog who we basically had a fight with the editor, Greg Johnson, what makes you think he's actually sincere about white nationalism or it's just to push the buttons against the normative well, opponents and how's this how's this 2016 I, I took Midas right off self for the first time in over 20 years it was November 9th when Trump was elected the whole fucking two weeks after that, I was getting emails from all these white supremacists telling me thanks for putting out the book it was a real heavy thing to deal with it was harsh because I said I didn't interpret it the same way I'm taking this fucking thing off the of sale I can't be a part of it but I understood by December before Trump was inaugurated, when, when Obama brought up might is right and the Pope brought up might is right, what my young self would have done, my immature self, myself that wasn't going through counseling and struggling with what the fuck I was doing. And I would have fucking put that on the New York Times saying the Pope just said, this is the book, baby. The, you know, I would have promoted that fucking thing and America would be on fire by now. But I took it off sale. Goad made the decision to take his money from that, those people. But you're right. If someone else was hugging him and loving him and supporting him on the other side, he'd be over there because you're right. All that psychological shit ties in. He's looking to be accepted and loved and, and, and valid and all that kind of crazy shit you learn in counseling. You're absolutely fucking right. Because all I did was, you know, on my individual level, I just said, why does he flip the fuck out? And then he flips the fuck. I love, I, that you, yeah. I, love that you, I love that you see these psychological issues in this stuff because that's what the problem is with calling everyone a neo-nazi there are people who are well adjusted and into white nationalism and they're very educated they're ivy league those people are really scary to me it's not the juggalos who are confused who who will be on anyone's side if they hug them if they just love them and, and maybe we, we should quit ignoring well poor, well that's poor, I, I, angry, don't ignore poor angry people and they won't look to be validated with hate groups <laughs> well i actually studied the white nationalist types i actually study kind of that whole countercurrent scene the, the, those individual the so-called avant-garde white nationalists so you, you study my neighborhood my friends my family my zip code sure tell me all about it well no it's more like countercurrents is this like weird avant-garde homo nationalist and a lot of those writers like you said from goad and others they all come from that like punk scene but they're only writing white nationalism in this kind of bizarre libertarian like artsy sense not you can be anti-liberal in many ways like you said you could be a normal ben shapiro conservative but they do it in a way where it's like a uh, resurrect a uh, you know racial white superiority and therefore adolf hitler and all that and that kind of weird branch of white nationalism the countercurrent organization is kind of it's just in it for subculture because like you said it's the sincerity of if they are really smart and whatnot okay, there's a difference in race, but the white nationalists tend to think, no, they are inferior. Um, I'm only violent if I'm with other non-whites. And, and kind of these very strange arguments that sound more transgressive and irrational than they do intellectual. So I wouldn't say that they're smart and intellectual with suit and ties. I would just say there is a subculture that's predominantly influenced by punk that's more about being quote unquote queer or this kind of I'm gay and white nationalist than it is. It's about aesthetics and consumption, if that makes sense. Well, it is about class. It is about holding paper. If, you hold, if you're holding a college education and then you're holding a high school dropout, it's a very different situation in America. And that's what I'm talking about. Okay. And, and they are very different. We, are, we, do, we definitely do consume different artwork. And so these people present to you, I would imagine you're college educated. And so what is your attraction to it is my question. And I wonder if the concept of ignoring them 
doesn't come across to people or not giving platforms to Nazis. Like I'm, I'm like, people attack me. Well, you gave a platform to Nazi. And I'm like, yeah, what are you doing right now? You're doing a book about Nazis and talking about Jim Goat and Boyd Rice and everything. So you are too are giving a platform to Nazis, but you have a college education. So you're allowed to do it. Yeah. I, as a poor kid, kid, am not allowed to do that. Especially if you have a master's, you, I, I remember at School of Visual Arts, there was a fellow student who had an MFA that said Boyd Rice isn't nice and did that whole contacted Rice, John Partridge, all that. I was kind of jealous, but he beat me to it. And that was like in 20. 18 17 i mean i went i graduated in 2020 but shows you that people do listen to these things where studying esoteric far-right culture or far-right avant-garde can be but like you said does that give a platform for nazis well again it's it seems to be subculture i just like to know everyone's interest because what i see is a lot of people on the far left attacking the far right for the same reasons they want to climb power and they're climbing something that's imaginary they're they're actually suckling at the at the tit of capitalism or the power structure that they're fighting without realizing power is a, this kind of power is an illusion. You only have individual power. Unity is a fleeting moment, stuff like that. These are real, 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 real things. So yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, it's no, because, you know, just to go around because understanding politics, especially on the internet sphere is very important. And like you said, you know, if you're the poor guy studying politics, of course, you're going to be called racist just for having a discussion with the opposition of the right. far right. But at the same time, there has been the rise in the last two years of BreadTube, this kind of so-called uh, communist left wing, wherever we're talking about uh, non-compete, thought slime, re-education, wash. And then there's this kind of bizarre sect of, and this goes back to come town to Red Scare, where it's like hipster leftism or hipster Marxism, where mm-hmm. it's, you're trying to understand Marx in a hip way. That, that's almost like the mirror universe of countercurrents, but it's that you like Stalin and Lenin, but in, in a very hip way. And maybe I'm just kind of bringing up what's happening over at Verso or Zero Books, but I almost see this kind of class antagonism between left and right being different ways of consumption because we don't know how to deal with politics. So instead, um, I'm safer if I call myself left and read anything with Verso. If I read about Shrek and communism compared to what Countercurrents is writing about My Little Pony and white nationalism, both of them talk about this eclectic postmodernist consumption but to me this is as frivolous as subculture and what's transgressive and what provokes and that's what i'm interested in and i I don't know where if you've read or are familiar of that kind of left-wing scene compared to right-wing scene or certainly negated i'm certainly uh, what's going on now is nothing different than what's going on in fucking history the only thing is different is everyone thinks they're different the young people think it's different. I thought it was different. I thought it was, we were original too. But when you look back on history, these things seem to play out in cyclical ways. <clears throat> if you connected, first of all, one thing you should be doing with people like Jim Goad or Adam Parfry or any of these fucking people that are culture vulturing and co-opting a culture. If you're smart enough, young people, you what you do when you do this, when you're looking at countercultures and revolutionary things is, is who handed them the baton? Where did they come from? If they came from a, a school of thought or, or a school, you know, they, there's a different, that's a different perspective. When they're, and they're the other people at Culture Vault. Where did I come from? I worked with White Panthers. I worked with John Sinclair. I worked with R. Crumb. I worked with actual 60s revolutionaries. Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dorn. They're my Chicago family. They had blown up the Pentagon, one of these groups. They are the ones who taught me that what I brought forward was pure back then. It was a different thing. Then it was co-opted from people, you know, it's co-opted from like a Doug Mesner from the Satanic Temple or other people of that ilk. And they turn it into something different. And this goes what, back to and that's what you're studying. You're he's he's communicating to you the intellectuals. And I mean intellectuals as paper, you're college educated. I am not college educated, but I am definitely an intellectual. Um, and so I see, I, I see him presenting stuff to you that's going to bait you into helping him have a career, which is something like Doug from the Satanic Temple. When I got there, this is something that was one of these Ivy League tricks. Like, 
When you're a lawyer there, eh, there's thousands of lawyers. How do you set yourself apart? Get in good with a serial killer and represent them. Get your name in newspapers and have a career. This is their fucking deal when they go to these schools. This is what happens. So he's just talking to you to get a career. It's not the real pain and stuff coming from the streets. What is avant-garde today? Can you tell me? Can you name what avant-garde today? Because I can just basically whatever i think is against i mean as as cliche as this sounds i always think it's whatever is against the state and it's basically something yeah something that's way too hard you're right right. i I, I call it queer culture but it's just the against the states against what our current paradigm is absolutely the condition that somebody is outside the normative you you get it then you you really do get it that's exactly what it is and i would say like black lives matter shit like that going on yeah the the black in the queer body that's all well yeah. said but the trans it- the trans uh, the trans community to me is the most avant-garde shit going down right now like they're at the forefront of abuse they're fighting it people are backing them that's where the real transgressive shit's going down that i am excited about that's my cult what i'm watching is that's great like that is a wonderful fight you know and that's a that's tied into free expression and free speech and that's where I'm at. That's what's transgressive today. What was transgressive all that time ago was what we were doing. We were attacking the state. Exactly what you're saying. What I was doing was, was what needed to be done. What these culture vultures, that the limited perspective they took from it and take that out there is how they distort it. But the actual baton that was handed to me from white, black panthers, yippies, all that kind of stuff. I am bringing that torch and I am trying to hand it to the trans community. I'm looking for young people within that community or the black community to come and talk to me so I could tell them the techniques that my forefathers told me in my ear from their mouth to my ear that still is not online. It's still not in books because our culture, that that transgressive revolutionary culture goes mouth to ear because our shit's so fucking dangerous it gets wiped off the internet or as you would say at the beginning of the show i don't even know who you are dude but i study something that you basically helped create wonderful wonderful system you got here well i just wanted to loop back into satanism because that's something i always thought was interesting satanism because i've only right. seen that silly satanist documentary about two years ago which, which talked about uh, it was, um, I, I saw it at the Ritz in Philadelphia, um, mm-hmm. Satan documentary. It basically was like this kind of very clean, polished, hail Satan. Okay. And see, see, that's not a documentary. So fucking use the words, right? I'm sorry to say this. It's a, it's a, that's a propaganda piece. Did, did, was, <laughs> I, was I in that fucking movie? Uh, no, that's why I, because right, exactly. that was my, this is like introduction to it. Right. And when I come into that fucking, I went and saw that movie. And oh man, and I had like I had, I have to go to bodyguards with that shit, and more for me for, for you than them because I I might attack someone, so I go with a handful of guys, and the satanic temple tribe starts to sit around me, you know like like to to ca- to wait for me to attack this filmmaker because she's up there, and I'm listening to her and I'm ready to stand up and say something, and she knows I'm there and she says there were a few other people in the beginning but they weren't relevant to well not relevant, are you fucking kidding me? Doug was my protege for fucking 15 years. That bitch fucking learned everything. I'm not, now that guy's a really smart guy and he's, he's has, he's well studied and well read. I, I'm not, I shouldn't say it like that, but he, what he's doing with that, that, that sliver of his life is from me, but no one knows that this is what culture vultures do. And it's not like I even give a fuck. I do. I care credit where credit's due. I'm a LeVay fan. You know, LeVay was my friend. I agree with you. Credit where credit's due. And me asking for credit for something that puts me in peril is, I guess, silly, but it's not. I think it's obscene that someone's doing that stuff. And like, it's outrageous to me. It's I'm more outrageous. I'm not even at mad at Doug or this stuff, because of course, that's hats off to you, bitch. You stole it. But it's like you guys, the consumers that don't even have the mind to ask questions of like where this came from. Everyone ran at the goat. Everyone ran at the name Satan. And I knew they would when I told, I mean, I have emails saying this. All we got to do is put sharp images like the Gacy makeup, it's the psychology behind the Gacy makeup. All we have to do is change that stupid logo Kevin gave us, the child fucking goat logo with all the, the rounded edges, the real nice thing where he's making fun of Satan. This one originally what they presented to me was, we want to make fun of Satan. It's called minions. I said, no one will ever follow that when you call Satanist minions. And you got to put sharp points on things. You can't use the goat because it's used by the church of Satan. So you have to come up with a fucking violent animal or teeth, tooth and claw, violence, points. It, it, it creates, it attracts this 
this violent person, this, it, it tracks. So that's what we did. And immediately, immediately after starting to work with them on that stuff where they couldn't get a dime for anything. When I started to consult them, all the money came in, everything started and it was all based on that fucking logo. And if you go back and look at articles, Doug will admit this. Oh, Shane's gone crazy. He's gone off the, he, cause he gaslights me because I'm not educated enough to communicate as he does. So I'm crazy automatically. Of course, all poor people are, all women are as well. How would you? But he why, said in this article, he said, but Shane did, we, what Shane's, what, what, what did he have to do with it? He taught us what, uh, how important aesthetics were. And no, what I said was how stupid people were. How fucking stupid these kids would, do, do, would be to run to something like that just to buy a t-shirt without, without understanding anything they're doing. And it's sad to see that that's true. Well, I just wanted to know where when we first talked, it was about, you know, Jack Donovan was a part of the Church of Satan and how yeah. that kind of prank, prank, I call it prank kind of punk rock culture from Hail Satan to, you know, talking about social justice issues where Jack coming from, you know, being gay without mm. the gay. How does how does that what you know, what is your involvement with, you know, Jack Donovan and how he interprets Satanism? Isn't it a correct form and where he is today? Can you tell me where the prankster culture comes from in the 60s? Where well, it came would, to, where, who gave it to us? I, I would guess. just I would just make a guess and say like we maybe hippie culture or just youth no, just well, being against the state or yeah but it, no it came from it, no this what we did what came directly from like the moment of um here tv is looking for anything so black panthers did enter the theater of the absurd they stepped onto the stage and they did something absurd to get their message across the yippies did the same thing the satanist levey did the same thing and from like diane levey's mouth stan levey's mouth he did it just to get churches taxed that was his deal. He was like, okay, they're attacking that. I want churches taxed. So he went after it like that. And it was all about that. It was the same time Scientology happened, same time sci-fi happened. And all, and LeVay, the guy from sci, uh, Scientology and sci-fi, uh, Forrest Ackerman, all sat together and we're talking about how are we going to fucking make money off art? And the Scientology guys, I'm going to make a religion. And I hear from Forrest Ackerman when we, we used to hang out that LeVay said, I'm going to do the same thing. And that's what happened. So the Church of Satan was kind of the start of this whole transgressive oh, free punk yeah, rock. Yeah, and, and it's just a rock to, to use it to mock and, and make fun of and mirror your society. Laugh at them. Show them. Here. It's, it's like we're mir like artists do. We just mirror what we're seeing. We're reporting. We're, we're documenting. Like people come after me. I'm like, how the fuck would I not document white, poor white culture without rebel flags and shit like that? Like, that's what I see. <laughs> Anyway, that's where this comes from, that, that Joe culture. And the only reason it was valid or relevant is because TV gave it a moment. And then they, they were like, oh, shit, we got to control this. We let these clowns in and they're not actually clowns. So that's the same thing that when we had the Internet, I spoke to Doug about. We have a clear moment here, just like my forefathers did. The Internet's here. We need to put the clown makeup on and get on the stage. And that was the 24 hour radio show and us running at this opening where there was no more middle people. I didn't have to ask a store owner to put my zine in there. I didn't have to ask anyone and I didn't have to be nice to communicate. We can get on here and just go fucking go. And, but that's, that's being curtailed right now. So you have to wait for another moment where you can actually communicate to the entirety of the world. Well, it seems like from this historical narrative, it can be the, 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 the activism of say uh, sixties, the Satanists, the punk rock, then what we're saying, the Hatesville avant-garde, culture vulture stuff of 90s and then today it's somewhere in between this extreme political died between far right and far left and internet culture but you're only paying attention to the culture vulture stuff because unfortunately that's you're you, you are sheltered in a way that's good i mean you're just from a different class but but in the 90s there was a, the zine movement started too and that was one of the most empowering things for everyone all artists you included like that zine movement was really crazy and cool mm -hmm. And that's what I was more a part of than anything. And I yeah, think I that's the zine, the, 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 the Xerox paper stuff that, yeah, that was yeah. kind of 90s, 2000s. And I think there's been a resurrection with print on demand. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, from, I mean, again, if we're talking about culture vulture, I, I think today there's this kind of upper class zine culture, whether it's alt lit or the bizarro fiction where, um, you know, if you go to Codex Books in Manhattan, they're very fine $30 books that try to be like Larry Clark's kids, but in 
text and that seems to be liked by a very top liberal elite but what you're talking about was the early days and 90s and kind of still today where it has to do with the punk subculture this kind of yep. written uh no isbn number whatsoever I, it's i'm talking i'm talking about the real thing versus marjorie yes i'm talking about the real flesh not the synthetic fiber yes yeah, with Kanye West uh, co cop the zine thing uh, 10 years ago, you know, it's been being co-opted forever. But yeah, there's a real, there's an actual real one and then there's fake. And you're just talking about fake zines. Zines I mean, are for poor people. If you're fucking <laughs> making money, you're not putting out a zine. You're putting out something else. Get the fuck out of here. Quit taking, quit telling me you're making a burrito when it costs $30. It's not a burrito mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, uh, for my only exposure of what you're saying, the free zine things would probably be uh, some bookstores in Bushwick, if I recall, in the dead. Quimby's, Quimby's Queer Store. Yep. Yeah. 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 There's a uh, that. And I think it's this cassette Thousand Dead Gods or something. They People want to bring back the nucleus of the 90s. Go talk to Stephen from Queer Quimby's Queer Store. He started all of us on a fucking rage. That guy's store in Ridgeland, Chicago, you would walk in there as a kid and it was known around the world because you'd walk in there and this motherfucker would have every magazine in there. And I mean, fascist shit, anti-fascist. Yes. Like, Nambla yes. pamphlets, child killing pamphlets. He had every fucking thing on those shelves. And it was amazing to me. It was so empowering. I'm, you mean I can have a say? I'm going to say, I'm going to say something. That was one of the greatest places to walk in. Oh, God bizarre because the first time i found out about that store was through a podcast with adam and peter sotos that was published by that uh quimbley's bookstore yeah i went to that book sign yeah I, that was i think that maybe it was in when he was in chicago i i was a when when quimby's was in chicago it's not any longer the quimby's that's in chicago is basically a comic book store the original quimby's queer store owner is in brooklyn new york and that's the only quimby's in america i see that i've been to that one i've been yeah, to the he's beautiful talk to steven bro he he could fill you in on a ton of this shit man he's a fucking he's the archivist he's the fucking archivist mm -hmm. he's your he's your gold this is quimby yeah yeah i the, i because i lived in bushwick for about a year and uh of course then i was in the bay area now i'm back in pennsylvania but yeah, yeah, I, I, the, the 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 Chicago bookstore in that I was very interested in that just only because of internet podcasts that they were having, and it's oh, funny you say all those genres of you know as absurd as the, the Nambla pamphlets. Yeah, and what what I'm what I'm interested in like the silly I don't know if you're into bestiality podcasts that like <laughs> absurd like that like nope you're, I'm not actually I'm I want to make it official I am not but tell me more. <laughs> oh well this is a big digression here but like things like zooier than now where it's a bunch of guys talk about how it's a social justice issue to be have relationships and be promiscuous with animals and political correct talk and they have their own pamphlets on what is it, zooier than now what the, that, that that whole like you know zoo sexual sphere is like the original intention of the liberal trying to enter those dark spaces and that's exactly what those you know the bookstores would have and you know you would have you know like you said the fascist the anti-fascist communist anti-communist yeah. it was the introduction and i see that and that's what i believed feral house was trying to do and then nine banded books from chip smith was trying to resurrect and basically one of my old school arguments was that i called it all queer culture it's not that you're gay or something queer isn't strange right 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 queer, queer store, right and the queer store would be, you know, you don't have to be, you could be cis and white to be queer. The point is you are entering these dark spaces to yeah. talk about these things. You are not afraid. And that's like the classical liberal sense. But again, yeah. I think today, you know, I have to be very careful. I mean, I use my full name, Joseph Francis Nally, but the point in being is that some people who just don't get it, they put you on a hate list or something just because- Really? Tell me more about this. Well, I mean, if you're a journalist- you know, I've been run out of multiple towns, correct? I mean, yeah, okay, if you're so a journalist and you interview, say, the neo-Nazi Asian cowboy, the, 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 the Korean American who thinks he is a white neo-Nazi supremacist, uh, you know, SBLC or ADL will put you on the list just because you're interviewing the guy and you give him a, a platform, like you said. But again, there are many people who just want to read this and say, why is he a neo-Nazi cowboy? I mean... I was really into, when I was in the Bay Area, I was into Joseph Chambra, a gay Catholic porn star, gay ex-porn star Catholic. You know, Joseph Chambra in his book, Disordered, how he talks about Palia and his horrible, you know, relation, his gay time, you know. But things like that. I got, I got something for you. 
was that? Yeah. So, so you ever hear of the band Rahoa? Yes. Okay. So at the time I grabbed Might Is Right and found it, I was looking at it and I was interviewing this guy from Rahoa. I was, I was working with the Milwaukee Metal Fest <clears throat> and I'm trying to understand all this stuff. And I'm reading Might Is Right. He says, this is our Bible. He sends me Might Is Right. At the same time, a Satanist hands me Might Is Right. He says, oh, you got to, or a Satanist hands me Satanic Bible and asks me to read it. So I'm reading both of them at the same time. I'm going, this is the same fucking book. And uh, forget where I'm going with this. What the fuck were you talking about? Well, it's just about how the, 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 the extreme literature culture and how all of this is just when you try to investigate, it's like, it's, it's not bad. It's not a crime to know these spaces. Oh, you know? here we go. Here we go. So anyway, okay. yada, yada, yada. I, I, this George, the white supremacist guy, he wants to take an ad out in my Milwaukee Metal Fest program book. And I'm perplexed. And every person around me, all white, told me, no, don't do it, Shane. You can't do this. I go, man, they're throwing a lot of money our way. And I had a writer who was Jewish, and she's a professor at DePaul University, Dina Weinstein. And she, I went to her and I said, I said what, Dina, what do I do here? And she goes, you have to take the money. I said, explain to me why. She says, you create a taboo, and you're going to have more people looking to find out what that is versus giving them their fucking platform and letting them sound like fools because basically all they are is ignorant they say things that are outdated it's ignorant it's easy to disprove so let them talk let them be beaten down okay great so i go to the black gentleman who's doing the cover art for me and i ask him what do i do he says pretty much the exact same thing he does a cover art you know specially designed for it with a, a, a metal head with dreads and all this kind of shit and then the inside front cover has this rahoa ad well that you know, and I also got an ad in the, in, in the um, Foundations Forum, uh, which was an international music festival for Rahoa. That's how they entered the public sphere before they were really shunned and stuff like that. And so how do you like that? That was, I was told to do that from people that said, don't let that taboo happen. And then 25 years later, I see, wow, this really grew. Yeah. So, so well, I don't know. I don't know. At, at this point in free speech and stuff, I wonder... I wonder if you should be platforming people who want to kill and stop your speech. As an artist, I used to think, yeah, we want to let everyone have their say. But then as it's getting serious now, I'm like, do I really want people that want to throw me out of a helicopter have speech? Like it comes down to survival. A little, a little, a little digression. I remember when Feral House, they got the whole thing when they did Ian Brady's uh, book, you know, Serial Killer Lore here, where the intro was by Colin Wilson. The afterward was Peter Sotos and when Parfrey was said, like, why did you put this like glorification book of Ian Brady out here? And he's like, well, it's just for the exposure. And I don't, I don't know if your, well, your opinion on Ian Brady is this, this sounds like a digression here, but yeah. what is the limits of giving that voice to the serial killer? And does it cause harm? Like Crime is different harm. than politics. You're, com you're putting two issues together that are not. Okay. First of all, they are political and there is a serial killer. They're very different. Okay. Exploring news isn't a bad thing. Peter Sotos, though, on the other hand, another Chicagoan, do you know that we, we had great issues? He, he asked me to pull his name out of, if you look at the printing I did of Answer Me's Rape Issue, Peter's name is yep. no longer in there. Mm. Well, I, I have the reissue, actually, where yeah, the, Quality Time is in there. Who? His, his short story, Quality Time. He, he wrote that for the rape issue. It might be in there, but his name isn't in the front page. I, the one I put out, I don't know what reissue you're talking about. I reissued it. The nine banded issue. books, the nine banded with the Trevor Brown arts, and it's all Goad's issues with the rape game in it. Okay, I, I'm not familiar. I'm just saying from the one I put out, um, you know, I don't pay attention to that, those people. That, I, I pay attention to the future, not, not the past. But um, you took his name out. Yeah, because he, well, he forced it. I'm just saying he's, a, he's, a, he's another one of these people who runs, who's, he, he, he. he well, I've he, always been interested. He presents himself in one way, but he doesn't have the integrity to do that. I mean, no, no hippie or no white pants or black, no one else from the actual culture would do that. Like they wouldn't care that their name was in a zine because it was associated with me. I mean, Peter Sotis is a, you know, like he doesn't want to be associated with me. Why? <laughs> yeah, that's so, mean, well, I wouldn't want to be associated with him. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The thing is, the bizarre part when Parfrey was alive and I said, can I have Sotos's email? And he's like, you're you're not worthy to have his email. And I was like, well, why? This, this guy just seems like he's interested in power electronics. He went to an art school in Chicago and he's just interested in this male feminist perspective. And I guess he'll only talk about this kind of, 
you know, Larry Clark horror story lifestyleism for so long where, oh, I'm just meaning it for the image. I mean, what, what you know, he'll, he'll definitely go to like a French museum to speak about his work, but I haven't, um, I don't know. It's like a lot of his art is pretty tame, actually. I wouldn't Ooh. say it's that bad. Peter Soto. So a lot of his art is just like common sense Andrea Dorkin straight edge stuff with a little tint of power electronics, White House. Uh -huh. noisery you know but i don't know why most of that is considered probably because he got in trouble with just getting child porn and doing this i think it's because but... from being back in the day it's because what was found in his apartment it wasn't the content you know like artwork is one thing and as you're looking at it's right but when you when someone raids your apartment and, and you you it's not only that you're possessing like you know i knew i knew some you know hanging out with bob rudnick one of the original white panthers he had child porn cards that were in his drawer that he was going to use for artwork that came from an LA cop from Skip Williamson. I'm like, eh, I ain't going back in these stories, but sorry, I'm rambling, trying to figure out these memories. But um, Peter, from my memory, when that happened in Chicago, he was caught with a lot of fucked up stuff. And um, mm. yeah, it's hard to say I, that's just art. My, my uh, one, I wonder why no one's ever asked more questions about that. They just talk about the freedom to do things, but what was, what, what happened? How did he get out of that? Does he have rich parents? Does he have a senator in the family? Because I remember when it happened, it was real fucking serious. And as a zinester, I wanted to defend him. But then when we, un, when, when we started, it started to unfold, it was like, oh, this guy's maybe not a zinester. Maybe he's using this to get creepy. And that's how the vibe was back then. I don't know how he became uh, some sort of a <laughs> transgressive legend. I don't know if he is. <laughs> yeah, he he kind of just milks the pure story to sell more copies of when he has. So he's mean, another guy. He's not pure. He's not. He doesn't have integrity. He's a guy who talks shit. And then when he when you get into his face, you go, "Hey, how how you doing? Nice to meet you." Jim Go did the same thing on the internet my mail tour. He talks shit about people. If I see them, I'm gonna kick their ass. And he get out of the van. The guy be standing. He goes, "Hey, I'm Jim," and he walk away. And I would always laugh about it. I'm like, "What in the fuck?" <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah uh, peter does come off as that like transgressive chicago type of i don't know i don't know what to say but you're right about the wealth part because... yeah you better watch what you're saying i'm from chicago transgressive type what are you gonna say <laughs> <laughs> no, no i'm just saying no because i'm just guessing from my observations and watching videos of him and how he writes you know he'll, he'll write a horror story and then he'll write a sincere piece about you know why serial killers are wacky like the, my, my favorite piece was bait by him, which was at the end of um, the, the Ian Brady. And he just basically, he said in it and says, oh, I, I don't mean any of this. Ian Brady's a whack job. And if anybody was to worship Ian Brady, that's horrible because I'm actually against Ian Brady. Well, at that point in his career, he's have to put disclaimers in there to get it in any bookstores to be considered legitimate. Putting a disclaimer on your artwork is fucking, again, not pure. Mike Diana's books and nothing I put out that was actually in court for obscenity ever got a, ever got a label. And everyone's at books bookstores hey you got to put a label on it go why it's it's a obviously a violent cover i'm not going to put a label on any of my shit ever and i never have you do that to sell things yeah yeah Explain I mean, yourself to sell things that's what peter soto says he's another culture vulture yeah he sells books as art like right. he'll it, sell but, home right. which is basically some serial killer who i guess jizzes on a vhs tape and talks things and but we're reading a horror novel and then the newest book is just his art criticism of how he thinks about subconsciously. And it's just flip to any page, read it like a little wisdom. And I don't know. It's just text is art. And so here, here for me, I got a question for you. Do you, are, so I'm, I'm, are you able to separate the artist from the art? Yeah, I, I, I am. Yeah. It's just, it's Sounds so easy. Like it. So it's, it's very. That's me. I can do that too. So it sounds like I could read Peter's stuff. And, and, and read it as you're reading it. But I also know him personally. So I, 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 I don't like him. But I, I, like I said, Jim Goad's a really a great writer. But I think he's a prick. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's usually the case. And I don't think he's genuine. I don't think he has integrity. This is where I'm going. Do you know about uh, Margot Mecheland? No. She, she was, a I guess, Adam Harvey's roommate. She writes for Countercurrents. And they write in this very writing, you know, white nationalist historical style and kind of yeah i mean a lot of that seemed seemed to move from far right interest because it was transgressive and then peter's just still doing his art books well, to get an I, art gallery but yeah how I, I see all of this is we're just arguing about where we're going right and the old people like myself or those people that are stuck in the old i'm not i'm not even stuck i don't feel like i feel like i'm 28 still i don't i don't really stick in the past but i think 
it's like, um, what are you trying to get from these elders? What answers are you trying to get? Because um, I don't see them having any relevance or anything new to say. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. What do you get out of these people? Well, it's just, well, the one thing is just one footnotes to a bigger queer culture or a bigger okay. avant-garde culture and the historical what's happening. The infighting has always been fascinated with me gotcha. and how people think. And the inf it's a very important, the infighting, because it shows you political decisions, what they're thinking about, uh, why do they, and then like, as we began this, well, their household names to Ladia Lunch, Margaret Cho, Doug Stanhope, and Chuck Palahniuk. And then meanwhile, that enters the mainstream. And then it becomes kind of this sacred thing where that writer shouldn't be made fun of. It's like this golden calf mentality. And so in my, my own studies of studying, say, the far right, the far right seems to be motivated by that early Boyd Rice subculture rather than ethics or like political action or something. Right. And that's always you... been my thing. It's always been right. subculture rather than practical political science. But they're not the subculture. They're the culture vultures of the subculture. And that's why you have these, these people attracted to something that's not the real thing. They're repelled from the real thing. It's always that way. Come to the ghetto, brother. You will see what I'm saying. They come and take our stuff and they present it to you for a reason, but it's not what we wanted presented. And that's where I'm, I'm a street artist. I sit there and look at the street level. And, and when once it becomes uh, margarine, yeah, the fucking that goes all over. That's what everyone eats. It's not this high end truffled butter that the subculture actually is very intense, very diverse, very angry. And that culture still exists, but it's underground. And you won't realize it maybe until another 20 years when someone culture vultures it. And you do a study, someone like yourself does the study of it and goes, oh, this was just actually the surface under this. The underground is where it really came from and where the real meaning was. But what Goad and them present is meaningless. It's only meant to get hits and love and attention because they see what brings people to them. Real artists, real transgressive people repel people. They say the mm. truth. They make enemies, not friends. They make art, not friends. There's yeah. a difference. That's what fucking artists do. Yeah, I, I, what I think the, the, the final question is in this discussion is how, where is, there seems to be a clash between authenticity and how you're acting like, and do you really mean, and this goes back to the queer condition, do you really yeah. mean being trans, that's just who you are, versus the culture vulture who's inauthentic, who wants to be trans, or being trans to get this kind of fictitious love. So I think this is really about the talk between the divide, what is authentic, what is inauthentic, and can there be this authentic underground here, which mm. called often queer culture, versus the inauthentic who are influenced by these things, and then just project it how do you divide is there is there a piece between that. the two or is it more when is there how do you define mainstream co-op versus the authentic and cultural anthropology or what's really going on versus well, I, I see this as generational i think i see at least where i would cut slack a lot of younger kids are going to try to figure out where they're going and so they're going to a uh, culture vault or experiment or lift or like, maybe I'm, maybe I'm trans and they get into it and they're trying to figure things out. And that's where the conversation amongst that community goes on and they get to figure out where they're going. And that's cool. That's, a, you know, that's, that's what happens when you're younger. But then when you have someone like a Doug Mesner or Doug Mexico from the Satanic Temple, he comes in and co-ops something, has no attachment to the underground and is now in an Ivy League that, 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 that brews cops and top tier cops and presidents, and he's running a subculture. It no longer is that. You see the difference? When you get in a position of power, it becomes kind of the institution rather than the free form uh, party that just does whatever and has their own. And well, so it seems well, it's just generational and it's class. Okay. He's no, you know, like. And when I look at younger Satanists, they're trying to get into that stuff. I see their intent is pure. Like they really do want to mix it up. They're, they're trying to figure out where they're going. And I, it's a shame that 
someone is again attracting them just for dollars like come to me and give me donations like go come to me and give me hits that's all that's going on there they're just a tool for a career now they're not actually seeking occult knowledge seeking occult knowledge is exploring underground subjects going to places that you don't understand and really risking it and putting yourself in peril to get answers that's what magicians do or occultists or satanists and so that's what a real satanist does and the, the word does have meaning a satanist and well, that's what I actually, what's one of my projects actually in the artistic realm was to understand. And I keep doing that forbidden knowledge and I'll use my own semantics to kind of screw things up in a weird, funny, private way. But I, I like, I like where this is going and how this, uh, it kind of has its own school of thought, which I think is just not known. Most people don't know. And I think more people should know about this kind of transgressive culture that you're advocating about and those principles and philosophies for sure. I appreciate you're trying to get the history down in archive uh, some truth. And I hope in the future when people do check this valid relevant art movement out, that is not in museums. And when it is in museums, I'm sure your work will stand the test of time. And it's a good thing that you're doing that. And you see this as an art movement. Um, not many do right now. So I, I wish I could live long enough to see the full body of your work and how this turns out but probably well, this, is a great, this is a great conversation shane bugby and I, I i would like to continue and probably do another podcast yeah i never got to get into sean i wanted to get my hooks into that bitch ah uh, <laughs> yeah well well next maybe time, brother next time i don't know if you can because it's just the instagram story too is kind of oh i want to know about that or sean maybe i don't know what else you could say about maybe yeah if we we have some time i mean it, what could you say about sean partridge and just your relationship with him Oh, I just want to know. I can try to be quick. Um, I just don't appreciate anything he's doing. I, I see him as a typical culture vulture. When I did the Angry Right Mal tour, he sent uh, the woman, the woman he played off of, um, Gidget, maybe is her name? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Okay. So she comes up, uh, you owe Boyd Rice money, <laughs> some shit. And then, you know, that they realize they're dealing with the real guy because I'm like, I don't know, maybe I pulled out a knife. I didn't, but I'm like, where's your boyfriend who where is he and she goes why and i'm like because that's the person i'm going to talk to because i'm going to start beating his fucking head in excuse me kids i was a violent violent young man and i'm i'm not that and it was awful it's an awful existence don't go there um but that, that was yeah, that was sean partridge right oh i assume but i, I you know i wanted i wanted to you know if you're going to come at me don't send the girl because at that time and in Chicago, in the culture in Chicago today is just like, watch what you fucking say, or you might get hurt. So I unfortunately have to deal with that trauma every fucking morning I wake up. But that's what happened then. I don't do that now. <laughs> um, and it just broke into this whole thing. Like, it was just incredible. Like, and that's where it just started to see. I'm like, oh, we're culturally different. We're, we're class. It's class difference here. It's a class. And you think you can treat me this way. You think you could talk to me that way, huh? Like, I'm not, I'm not a businessman. Like, Boyd Rice, we, you, I don't know how much long. I got. I can go for another hour on the story. No, no, you could go. We, we have time. I, I'm Boyd just Rice curious about Sean and uh, Boyd, because I think that's very important. It gets back to the whole Instagram. I'm getting anxiety about this recording. How long Zoom let me record? I don't know. It's still recording on your behalf. Okay, so. we're gonna find oh, out. Okay, so I'm gonna try to. I'm mean, having. I'm gonna relax from my anxiety for a second. <sighs> okay. Um. So Sean Partridge is that, and he's part of this whole clique, and and they're just, as I say, culture vultures. So they're always feeding off of my people. Let's say the Juggalo Nation, the black metal people, the, the metalheads, the, the the angry that's angry subculture. They're fee they're they're vampires, they're psychic vampires. And they feed off of us. So I don't like Sean. I don't like anything he presents because what he presents is the exact opposite of my politics. Um, Boyd Rice, on the other hand, I was kind to him uh, and anti a, a friend of mine who passed away asked me to invite him to my expo the extreme before my friend passed away and i did i didn't know who boyd rice i knew but i didn't care like he was not part of my culture <laughs> and so like anton levey would start talking about he'd bring up drop names and i'm like yeah i don't know who boyd rice is he goes you don't i'm like no and and then you know but so anyway boyd comes to this event called the expo the extreme it's a big deal event in america it was one of the first of its kind 
and it set the set trend for like riot fest and other things and i invented all these just radical fucking people you know uh fang sammy just got out of prison for murdering his girlfriend and uh you know just really crazy and it was upsetting the, the venue promoters like he was crying at the end of it asking me how could i do this so it was really intense situation and boyd was there and had his theremin and was going to perform and all of a sudden i'm told he's not going to perform and i'm like why and the sound sound people tell me well he's got this theremin and says it doesn't work but we know it works and the sound company i paid was like I overpaid because I was naive. It was like a stadium. They, they did like the Ro Rolling Stones. They were union. So they really knew what they were doing. And they're like, dude, we can fix that. Because you know, I got on Boyd Rice and Boyd's like, no, I don't want. And, and he's like, we can easily fix that. We can get you a new one. We'll go rent one right now at Theremin. And Boyd's like, no, no, no. And anything they tried to do to get him to perform, because if he didn't perform, it was like they, they failed. He backed off. And later I talked to some of the black metal folks from Scandinavia. They told me what was going on. They're like, he was afraid. I'm like, how could you tell? And he's like, the look in his eyes. I'm trying to do a Swedish accent or something. I can't, but the look in his eyes. And, um, and so present day, he puts up this photo and goes on about how I didn't pay him and all this kind of shit and bad talks me because, because he's uh, at this point, low hanging fruit in the satanic culture. He's, you know, who, he's like, uh, it's like an ape stepping into another culture, uh, another era. I mean, look at him and look at what he says. Look what he does. He's, he's not in touch with the youth. And the thing about Anton LaVey was he was in touch with the youth. When I went to see him, I was in my 20s. And I was like, how, you know, like I talked about like how different, you know, like why would you invite me here? Like I was expecting, you know, like I'm so, you know, we're so different in age and stuff. And he talked about the youth is where the future, I like to predict the future. And I can only predict the future if I know what the future is. And I know what the future is when I talk to young people. And, and so I sort of stuck, that started stuck in my head and I started just hang out with young people. And um, so that's the difference when I look at Boyd Rice's thing, but, but it was outrageous to have, for me, it wasn't outrageous. It's sort of cool because I whooped his ass in the argument and he deleted all my comments, blocked me, <laughs> ran away from me. And, you know, as I said, let's argue in public. Let's not do this digitally. Let's get on a stage and argue. I will, I will love to do that with you. Let's do that. I'll come to your house. We can do this live, but I'm not going to do it like this. No, I believe they're all in Denver or Colorado. That's fine. I'll go there tomorrow. You want to go there with me? You call the camera. I'll do it. We'll knock on his door and we'll argue. Oh, I wish I'd have to, I think, I think it's $400 to get an American airlines ticket. Okay. So if I get money up to do this, you're going to do it. Oh, no, I don't have the dip in 400. Well, we would have to have a, do you have Boyd Rice's address? I'll get like, shit, dude. I'm in the, I'm in the click click. I can get anything from that. I got to make a call. I'll get your address. <laughs> so it's like, um, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go not only to his door or his bar and we're going to have an argument or he's going to show up in Chicago on April 30th and we're going to have an argument. He's got a choice. He does it. He does it willfully or for, I force it, but he's going to talk to me face to face on video and we're going to argue. I'm going to do the same with Doug Mesner. So they should both know I'm coming. I've asked him and I'm, I'm challenging them to argue with me on stage. And, uh, and, and I like how they run. And that tells you a lot about their conviction, their character, their lack of courage, and their intent when they're getting involved in this. Because no real deal motherfucker that's involved in the risk in their life, putting themselves at peril for their politics or their art is going to run. That's the and where, where, where does Sean Partridge fall in this? Is it Partridge also, you know, gossiping behind you? Or is it him leading Boyd? Because it seems like Boyd's more into Sean's work than anything nowadays. And he says he's a what partridge family temple cult that's what i know yeah, they're just one they're just one entity feed they're just like they probably i i would i would imagine if you did research they went to the same school <laughs> or they're in the same collegiate network yeah that's what they it, you know it's very typical of culture vultures <laughs> so uh, you know it's like something that's gone on for hundreds of years i would imagine that's what's going on well, there. The, 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 well another thing i forgot to and this almost slipped off my mind is that we were talking about unpop and it <laughs> said unpop yeah. My definition was Boyd Rice, Sean Partridge, and Brian M. Clark, copyright from 2010, I believe, or 2006. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time they tried to put the principles of that yeah. par free or aesthetic terrorism into, but they kind of just threw it out since then. And I tried to make my own article resurrecting because everyone forgot about Unpop. But it was basically, if you want to say, you know, that, that culture vulture of that aesthetic terrorism. I don't know where, but I always think their art was that that was the unpop principle what they're doing 
Well, Unpop, again, I think that's how we hooked up is that that and that's documented. You can look this up and that's there's evidence to this culture vulture stuff. So their uh, sycophants always attack me and they don't ever do any research. They're, they just want to attack for their, their whatever, they're, who they're suckling. But uh, it was in the Sun-Times, some interview about Frank Kozik poster show <laughs> that I was doing. I did the first Frank Kozik poster show outside of Austin. I bought Frank into Chicago and that was the... Uh, Chicago Cartoon and Poster Company poster he did. And then I, I, I had him in a show in Australia. And those were some of Frank's first big shows. And so when I had him in there, they did an interview with me for the gallery that I did it for. And um, one of the things I said is this represents, it's, it's, uh, we, we represent unpopular culture. I didn't say subculture or counterculture. I said, we're just, because that would be shocking to them. I create, it was like, oh, Andy Warhol's, Warhol's pop culture. We're unpopular. We're unpopular culture, I say in this article. We're unpopular culture, we're unpop. And I say it by mistake, it's not like, <laughs> someone else probably coined the phrase 10 years before me. I don't, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but when I see people that are in my, my exact kind of demographic or my, my people that are vulching off of my culture using that, yeah, they stole it from me. But I don't really have the need to take credit for coining words all the fucking time because I don't have real accomplishments under my belt. Like, I've got so many fucking accomplishments under my belt. These bitches can't compete. Yet, it's all taken from me by rich kids like them. Always. But no one does the fucking work. No one does the journalism to document this. They just suckle at who they, who looks like them. It's the same with job interviews. Whoever looks like you and sounds like you, you suckle. Yeah, it seems like the, that drama. I mean, eventually they probably will go to Chicago and you'll have to confront them. Oh, I wish. Yeah, but I, 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 I mean, I would like to hear the update. Or I would like to see Jim Goad and Doug Mesner on the stage at the same time. I'll do them both at once. That's how fake they are. Hmm. You see, I wouldn't do the real deal. If, now, 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 how's this? If, 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 if I'm debating people, there's some people I'd be afraid of, like Peter Gilmore. Uh, I'm enemies with Peter Gilmore, but... You know, dude knows what he's talking about. This is his life. He would be a good argument. <laughs> like, I'd be worried getting on stage with Peter because he knows what he's saying. It's his life. These other people are posers, and posers can be easily beaten by the real deal. That's why they'll never show. Boyd, Jim Goad, and Doug, here's a challenge for you. All three, you guys can get on stage, call the rules, do everything. I'll be there. Well, I think that should be... I mean, we'll have to leave it to another time just to talk about because I'm just interested in these relationships between all three. Uh, and I talk to you, talk to them. Just yeah, to I'm not, to I want to get it over with. I want to slay the beast and get on. I want to like move to South America and make clay pots. <laughs> fuck all this shit, dude. I did my shit. I'm, I'm sick of being angry. Like I'm, I did my my therapy. Like get the fuck out of here with this. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for peace. I got lilac infused oils going around my house right now just to stay this calm. <laughs> well. It's great to talk to you, Shane Bugby, and um, I hope to talk to you soon. Okay? The leader, what pills do you eat before we go? Well, actually, that was a name I made up in 2009 because it was a variant of Ink Drinker. Um, it the was, um, there was this y internet YTMND user, and I made an alt account, the opposite of Ink is Pill and Drinker is Eater, and it kind of just was there. I'm actually, uh, that's funny you say that because as long as 2014, somebody said, what kind of pills do you eat? I said, it's just kind of this avant-garde name that just happened to be made in 2009 and people associate with, it's a multiple meeting um, pen name, but if anything, I guess yellow pills. I take boost power, anti-anxiety. Ye yellow pill, any pill that's the color yellow. So nice. that's all. Nice, yellow it's, pills. Um, aesthetic yeah. wise, yes. It was great talking to you and I do hope we talk again. It, you know, I, I really appreciate your hard work and, and time you put into this. It's, it is an important culture to document. Please, because, please, because please stay in back too, because I, I always try to write on my Substack, my websites, you know, internet archive of putting all my old work on there. That's what I've been trying to do and just gang back into the whole YouTube game. So, well, you know what? If you just put your shit on a fucking disc and send it to, uh, send it to archive, you just call them and say, who do I send this to? I think it's Abe. And you just give them a disc, they'll upload it for you. All right. <laughs> all you got to do is write what it is in a text document. Like, this is each file and what it is, and I'll upload it for you. Gotcha. Um, well, and wait, wait, I had something. Oh, because of my, listen, next time if we do this, we should do it on video. Because if I see you, I don't overstep the word so much. I could watch. But here I get, oh, so, no. I, I get I can't. so excited. I run over people. I'm like, ah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm just, I can set up 
little i have a little space in my bedroom i can set up i mean i'm not that uh i mean yeah i'm fine i've done you could share my face i've done many camera inter- i've actually done the camera interview with hank Yu, the neo-nazi asian cowboy but sad news oh. is that video which had twenty thousand views was terminated and deleted oh, and i never so saved cool. up a back copy and i always ask everyone did anybody save that hank you that film hank you interview i did the neo-nazi asian cowboy and it's just now urban legend it's a crime it's a a SPLC says pill eater or francis nally interviewed had one of the only inner i'm like yeah but you guys deleted it you deleted evidence (laughs) and that's always something i'm upset about because because in that same interview i said questioning him have you read the work of james newlick you know i was like trying to be more liberal in the argument being like what is your condition would your condition be i don't know i just want to watch it It was four years ago but Twenty thousand views, and they and still on my YouTube channel. It's oh, you got a strike for hate speech. Advice well, he, to you. He was the one saying. So I was just right. Cultural anthropology. A- advice to you. Advice to you with that stuff. I've lost a handful of interviews. Like it's painful. It's so fucking painful. But just know. I mean, not even advice. Just know that. Just do more. Just do as much as you can, because you know half of it. Only half's going to survive. I'm yeah, Hank Hughes now in jail, which is. But only half your work's going to survive. It it goes away as you get older. It loses. It gets lost. It, so try to put it up online as quick as possible. Try to make it in print as quick as possible, and get it out there so it survives. Because it's so important for this 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 information that people want to hide to be saved. All right. Well, I'm going to log off now, Shane, and I'll Peace. talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Have a nice night.